Uh, I do all my work in the house or, or in our apartment uh, on Washington Square North when I'm in New York. I used to work in my study on the uh, third floor, but uh, in the last year or two when I started not feeling well, I felt too much in solitude and away from my wife up there. So poor thing, I have taken away her dining room table for the most part. Well, I, I scribble in those big ledger books. I never learned to type. Uh, I'm hopelessly uh, archaic. And there's always been a tremor in my hands from the time I was a little one. So I have, uh, fortunately, I have research assistants and uh, uh, they put it on a computer and then I read it off with them and I guess that's pretty much um, how I do it. Um, uh, these days, especially uh, in this long recuperation from an open heart operation, Susan, I tend to wake up about 4.30 in the morning. I come down and drink large quantities of, alas, decaffeinated English breakfast tea. Both caffeine and alcohol are now permanently forbidden. And uh, usually uh, by the time Jean comes down around 5 a.m., I, I start sitting here and scribbling uh, in ledgers for a few hours. That, that, that tends to be when I write. Well, I finished, uh, I finished a uh, huge uh, anthology with commentary, uh, which will come out a year from now, next April, uh, for HarperCollins. Yes, and there is the table of contents and the title page. It's called The Best Poems of the English Language, Chaucer through Robert Frost. And I'm trying to finish, in fact, I will finish by Labor Day, uh, another book for uh, my publisher more often than not, uh, um, Penguin uh, Putnam Riverhead, tentatively called Reaching Wisdom though the title is too pompous, so I may have to find another one, and I certainly am never going to reach any wisdom anyway. But the subtitle is The Use of Literature for Life, and that will stay there, and I, I'll just have to find another title. Well, uh, yeah, uh, I, I haven't been able to teach this year. Uh, once I start teaching again uh, next September, full-time at Yale, and uh, as I say, uh, down in New York City uh, for New York University Graduate School, uh, then uh, I won't be able to work uh, quite as incessantly, but uh, I'll do what I can. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm addicted to it, so uh, I, I mean, I read all day and all night anyway. I'm not much of a sleeper, and uh, on a good night, I manage three and a half or four hours, and that is usually uh, with the help of some uh, Sedative. I, I was out on the road. I am back from it. I think I have just one more trip uh, down to New York. Uh, look at camera. I would rather look at your blue eyes if I'm allowed to say so. Can I look at you and not the camera? You certainly can. Oh, good. You um, certainly can. No, I, I've mostly finished traveling for a, a short book called Hamlet Poem Unlimited. It, it was my sorrow that uh, a rather large book called Genius, A, a Mosaic, of 100 exemplary creative minds. I guess too encyclopedic a book, really. Um, it's an, an abandoned child uh, since they uh, gave me the open heart, uh, rather invasive of necessity, uh, surgery. Literally on the day the book was published, uh, I was never able to do anything for it. Well, Susan, I, I'm, I'm turning 73 this July and I started very early. Um, though again, uh, sounds almost pompous to say it, but I guess there are three phases. Um, I started out uh, very much uh, in the middle and later 1950s as a kind of uh, romantic revivalist, uh, you might say, arguing against T.S. Eliot and what in those days was called the new criticism. Uh, that seems hopelessly archaic now in 2003. Uh, on behalf of William Blake and uh, Shelley and Keats and Wordsworth and Coleridge and so on, and in general of the 19th century and indeed 20th century romantic tradition, down through, as I would define it, William Butler Yeats, Hart Crane, D.H. Lawrence, uh, Wallace Stevens. And then uh, 
I passed into a kind of long middle phase uh, in the later 1960s and earlier and mid uh, 1970s where I became obsessed with something I still haven't been able to uh, really work through. Uh, uh, Martin Heidegger, a philosopher with whom I'm not much in sympathy, nevertheless uh, has one sentence somewhere which struck me where he says that it is necessary to think one thought and one thought only and th think it through to the end. Uh, for him that was what he calls Dasein being. For me it has been uh, influence, particularly uh, literary influence, but indeed uh, influence in the general sense, which is still not, I think, a process uh, any of us, myself certainly included, uh, fully understand, uh, including the very complicated question of the influence of a mind, a more or less creative mind upon itself. Uh, especially fascinating, of course, where with the greatest of writers, Shakespeare, where we have uh, no uh, information whatsoever as to his inner life or inward being, so that we have to uh, surmise it. But in any case, uh, I stayed at that uh, for quite a long time until uh, the middle 1980s and then partly under the influence of an endless enterprise which I've carried on for at least 20 years now. I think I've edited by now uh, with introductions and editor's notes between 11 and 1200 uh, critical anthologies for Chelsea House Books. Um, and moved by the necessity of uh, writing less esoterically and with more clarity for people who would include um, high school students. I, um, I think, learned to handle these things very differently. And then, though, uh, I've made a resolution to try to avoid all polemic, which is always very difficult for me. Uh, I was thinking about that before we began today, and I have never been an intense admirer of uh, T.S. Eliot, although he certainly was a, a great poet, even if I'm never really in sympathy with him. But in four quartets, at one point, he dismisses his own past polemics by saying rather beautifully, these things have served their purpose, let them be. And I suppose, uh, partly in reaction to my own polemicism and my deep distaste for what had begun really, um, it's gone on for 33 or 35 years now, and it's really the effect of the so-called counterculture, which I think has now just about become our official culture in what increasingly, perhaps too disdainfully, I refer to as the mediaversity um, I, I decided to just uh, do an end run around the whole academy and try to write for as broad a general public as possible, uh, starting with uh, a book on the Bible called The Book of Jay, which came out in 1990. And for these last uh, 13 years, uh, that's what I've done uh, increasingly in what I've written. I, I, I go on. Um, teaching and hope to go on teaching until uh, I obviously am too feeble or too hopelessly a dinosaur uh, to be of any use to my students. But um, I feel, uh, have felt for a long time, uh, a lot of alienation. I, I, I don't approve of turning literary studies into what they call cultural studies. But that, that's pretty much where I am now. Well, of course, uh, <laughs> what is necessarily dwarfed into less than a pygmy by, by introducing it with the question of when, you know, the greatest, I would say, of all thinkers, as well as all writers, uh, became himself. Uh, uh, I, I don't know that I can answer. I, uh, uh, even though I, I was perfectly happy with the family in which I was, uh, the youngest child, uh, I was a sort of uh, fierce reader 
from the time I was uh, very small. In fact, almost my earliest memories are of uh, sitting on the kitchen floor uh, on Friday mornings when my mother, now so many years gone, of course, would be uh, walking around the kitchen preparing the uh, Sabbath meal for the evening. And I would be reading, and I still remember that occasionally as she walked by, she would rub the top of my head, and sometimes I would reach out and touch her toes, and she tended to be barefoot when she did that. But I couldn't have been more than four or five uh, at that point. And, you know, I, I always uh, wanted to read. I, I still remember... Uh, obsessive reader as I was when I was 11 or 12 years old. Uh, one of my uncles um, saying to me one day, uh, what, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I said, well, um, I don't know, but uh, I guess I would like to teach, you know, reading poems. And he said, well, he said, there are places, <laughs> sounds like a joke, uh, called Harvard and Yale. I had never heard of them. Uh, at that point, he said, where well, you could be a professor of poetry. And I thought of that back in uh, 1987 to 88, when I was going back and forth uh, at Yale, where I was the Sterling Professor of Humanities, as I still am. And I was being the Charles Eliot Norton Professor of Poetry at Harvard. And uh, one day, as I was being driven back to New Haven, I suddenly remembered what my uncle had said. Uh, I was a complete freak uh, when I was very small, doubtless inherited. Uh, I know it's a rather Lamarckian uh, statement that acquired characteristics can be handed on and the human genome people uh, would disapprove. But I, I think to this extent, uh, in terms of my own experience, they are wrong. Uh, almost have inherited from some Talmudic ancestor or other um, an amazing reading speed when I was young and a simply scandalous uh, verbal memory. Uh, the reading speed is certainly not the horror it was uh, when I was a little one. Uh, uh, it has slowed down uh, to moderate uh, scale now. Uh, but the memory, fortunately for me, it has always given me a, a great advantage as a teacher and, and reader and, and writer. Uh, the memory has, uh, has stayed on. Well, my wife the other day, when uh, a very charming fellow, uh, Michael Packenham of the uh, Baltimore Sun, was up here having lunch with us and interviewing me, after which we saw him down in uh, Baltimore, my wife said that back in the days when we were still courting, since we're about to have a 45th wedding anniversary, this must be about 47 years ago, she was sitting with me in the Yale Library one day, and she suddenly looked up, and she walked over behind me to see what was happening. I, I was so deeply sorry. And she said, you were just turning the pages, Harold, and uh, going on to the next one. I, I did read that quickly then, but not, not now. As I say, it was sort of freakish, and it certainly, Susan doesn't testify to any uh, necessary cognitive powers because uh, I'm always haunted by uh, Jorge Luis uh, Borges' very unsettling story called Funes the Memorius, in which, you know, someone, not quite a village idiot, but still not a person who is altogether there, has a scandalous uh, memory. Uh, if I want to. I mean, if, if, if I didn't like the book, uh, or if it annoyed me, uh, I tend to uh, blot it out. I, I think I just about do remember uh, all the poems I have ever loved, and indeed large swatches of the, uh, of the prose, though sometimes it does take an effort to uh, bring it back. In fact, I'm sure that one of my friends who are among the genuine people could explain this to me, um, just as now in increasing old age, uh, I have uh, those odd moments when uh, I'm trying to, if it's a, not a fictive name, it's the name of an actual old friend or person I've met, 
uh, I can't necessarily immediately remember it. I draw a blank. And if I let it alone for a few minutes and think about something else, it will suddenly come back at me uh, in the same way sometimes now when I, usually not with verse, but sometimes with prose, uh, when I try directly to sum it up, uh, there's resistance. As Wallace Stevens would have written, there is a conflict, there is a resistance involved, he goes on to say beautifully. And being part is an exertion that declines, and then he adds massively, one feels the life of that which gives life as it is. And I suppose uh, he's writing that in old age, and I suppose that's happening to me now also. Uh, no, uh, I, I, I met him once uh, up in uh, Toronto, uh, uh, a remarkable novelist. I remember the one conversation we had was about the whole question of the ancient heresy, to call it that, uh, which the late Hans Jonas, however, in a wonderful book called The Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, uh, Religion. Uh, Robinson Davies was uh, very interested in that. Uh, he, he is a uh, first-class novelist. Uh, sometimes they're very different, making me think of the late Patrick White uh, of Australia. If only because, uh, well, of course, Patrick White had gotten a uh, Nobel Prize for Literature, hadn't he? And uh, Robertson Davies was never so honored, though he should have been. Um, oh, it, it was a book published, I suppose, back around 1994, something like that. Um, a sort of large kind of a uh, book. I, I see it's down there in that pile somewhere. Um, I guess the first thing to point out is that uh, all a canon ever is, is a list. And no one, I, I believe, in the whole tradition of uh, what, what could be called a canonical tradition uh, of any kind, uh, uh, no one uh, that I know of, except, of course, people who have been defining uh, scriptural, that is to say, uh, religious canons, by the way, I, I must apologize uh, to the audience. I'm still on so many medications in my long recovery that uh, they produce uh, these unhappy uh, side effects, including a dry mouth and a running nose. So uh, do accept my apology for that. It, it can't be helped. Um, no one ever intended, except as I say, uh, those who were making and uh, trying to promulgate uh, uh, scriptural canons, uh, no one ever intended uh, that a list should be definitive or that uh, the canon should be exclusive. Uh, it is always an open matter. Uh, for me, it's, it's purely a matter of uh, the innate cognitive power and uh, aesthetic beauty of uh, a particular play, poem, novel, or story in relation to other plays, poems, novels, and stories. Uh, I guess there are two things I would particularly want to say about them. Uh, one is that I'm sorry, and this makes me hopelessly antique, and I'm violating what I quoted from Eliot. These things have served their purpose. Uh, let them be. But you know, the question of the origin uh, of the author, whether gender, sexual orientation, uh, pigmentation, uh, uh, supposed ethnic group, uh, and so on and, and so forth, is just not of the slightest interest to me. I, 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 you know, I, I just want to read what I have in front of me. And then the next point I would always want to make, and this is really uh, why talking about uh, the canon, whatever you define, or a canon, or a tentative or open canon, uh, the whole point is that uh, there's only just so much time uh, to read. Um, there are an infinity uh, of books. One, one can read all day long entirely, uh, you know, through a long life and still not have read uh, everything uh, of real value. It, it, it's impossible. Uh, you know, the world, I, I frequently think, it, it does not get so much worse or better, it just gets older. And uh, 
there is uh, an extraordinary uh, array of works behind us. So the question then becomes, uh, what shall we read? Because it is always a question of reading something, alas, in preference uh, to something else. Uh, and uh, that, I suppose, is what a question of any canon, Western, Eastern, universal, newfangled, old-fangled, has to be about. Uh, there's only so much uh, time, as the great critic Walter Pater said, we have an interval and then our space knows us uh, no more. And the question is, as he says, uh, what shall we uh, fill the interval with? And insofar as we are going to at least partly fill it uh, with reading, the question then becomes, what shall one read? Since, uh, And I, I would think of it as a question of excluding only in terms of that. Oh, no, no, thank you. Uh, uh, it, it, it is one of my great regrets, uh, and I'm too old now, I think, to learn a new language, that even though my, my father was born and raised in Odessa before he came first to the United States, uh, first to Britain and then to the United States, uh, he did not want to speak Russian anymore. So we spoke only Yiddish at home. And though I've learned uh, a number of other languages, I've never learned Russian. So uh, I've read him only in uh, translation. And uh, therefore, I'm at the mercy of the uh, translations. I've written a little about him. I edited one Chelsea House uh, volume of critical views uh, upon him. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I sometimes fear, though I say this under correction, uh, I mean, uh, it, it's no stigma, it's, it's no um, animadversion upon him to say that he is not Tolstoy. I mean, after all, who is, who will be again, uh, or Dostoevsky, uh, or Turgenev, or Chekhov, and so on. Uh, but his, his great interest, I fear, uh, for us uh, was that he was a... Uh, a testimony to the horror of the Stalinist uh, gulag, uh, the work camps. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel some reservations, reading him in translation, of course. I feel some reservations about him as a creator of character or as a, or as a narrative uh, writer. But I, 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 I say this with uh, diffidence and. Uh, without great conviction. Oh, Kierkegaard is uh, one of the great thinkers, one of the great writers, and uh, one of the authentic sages of uh, religious tradition, uh, broadly defined. And uh, <laughs> there are works by him like the ironic and beautiful uh, repetition, or the sickness unto death, or the concept of dread, uh, uh, which haunt me all the time, are uh, younger writers. Uh, there is, I, I think, an extraordinary uh, younger American poet, uh, Henri Cole, C-O-L-E, uh, whose most recent book of poems came out quite recently called uh, Middle Earth. Uh, there is the Canadian poet and classicist Anne Carson, now just past 50, who is something like a uh, great, a highly original uh, and learned uh, poet um, whose work uh, means a great deal to me. Um, there is Tony Kushner, uh, really an, an amazing dramatist who cannot be more, I guess, than in his, his middle 40s. Um, I would hesitate uh, to locate any particular novelist uh, of that generation as yet uh, in the United States or Great Britain. Um, but oddly enough, uh, it seems to me, well, perhaps it's not so odd. I mean, there, there are such uh, extraordinary uh, novelists uh, in the United States, uh, perhaps just younger uh, than I am, uh, who are very much in their prime, uh, Philip Roth, 
Thomas Pynchon, Cormac McCarthy, who's a frightening uh, and majestic book, Blood Meridian, may well be, uh, I think, the, the most eminent work by any living uh, American. There is Don DeLillo, there are novelists like Robert Stone and Ed Doctorow. Uh, that it's, it's a little difficult at, at this point for a novelist of the next generation fully to establish herself or himself. Oh, the, 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 the flaws, uh, intellectually speaking, uh, uh, of this society or culture now uh, are in the media and the universities. They, they are neither in the uh, imaginative writers nor in the general uh, reading public. Uh, this is still a country. I mean, every time I've gone out on the uh, road in behalf of whatever it is I've scribbled uh, in the last uh, 12 or 13 years, in including uh, fairly recently in Washington, D.C., and Baltimore, and Boston, and, and elsewhere, and New York City, uh, I'm immensely moved because uh, there are uh, tens and hundreds of thousands of uh, authentic uh, readers who, who really do have, uh, I think, uh, marvelous uh, uh, cognitive and, and, and aesthetic standards for what it is that they read and, and want to read. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a living American poet, uh, John Ashbery, who is uh, a figure who uh, stands, I think, with, uh, alas, uh, great poets who have died, uh, uh, A.R. Ammons, A-M-M-O-N-S, uh, my very close friend, Archie Ammons, who died, I guess, Less than two years ago, uh, James Merrill, who died only a couple of years uh, before that, Elizabeth Bishop, uh, uh, as great a poet as Wallace Stevens or Hart Crane or Robert Frost or Eliot, for that matter. Um, there's been no decline uh, in what I suppose you would want to call American literature or, or in the American reading public. Uh, my, my my complaint is simply with uh, what has happened to the uh, departments of what I would like to still call literature, but they mostly are not, or many of them are not, or only in part are they that. And also, uh, I'm not very happy uh, with the media. Uh, I find it, I would find it excruciating if I still tried to read the Sunday New York Times book review, but I don't try to read it anymore. In fact, I don't think it is to be read. Uh, it isn't written, so why, why should anyone try to read it? Yes, the judge, uh, th thank you very much. No, it's, it's, it's a very powerful question because the book is of such, uh, 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 such, such endless and uh, really frightening strength. Uh, uh, it, it's a book uh, with which I, I had a reading experience really unlike any other. When I first tried to read it, Many years ago, uh, I just had to give up after 50 or 60 pages. The, the carnage was uh, so great that I could not bear it. And then I tried it a second time. And again, uh, I wasn't strong enough for it. But then uh, it took me over, that is to say, uh, the great character in it, the frightening Judge Holden, who is uh, a kind of American, uh, a 19th century American version of Shakespeare's Iago. And, really worthy of being compared to him, which is, of course, uh, an amazing statement to make about uh, a character in a 20th century American novel. Uh, uh, the book is a terrifying vision, historically grounded in a uh, very uh, vicious band of uh, freebooters or filibusters uh, led by uh, a really murderous uh, fellow named Glanton, G-O-A-N-T-O-N. And along with him, and another historical character is what you might want to call, that sounds awful to say so, uh, the spiritual leader of this uh, horrible 
expedition, they have been commissioned by the Mexican and uh, Texan authorities to uh, clear the way to the uh, gold fields in California by simply exterminating uh, all of the Native Americans of the Southwest. And they, they have a great deal to do with all but uh, in, uh, in a kind of, uh, we can hardly even call it a little uh, holocaust, the, uh, the Comanches as well as other uh, Native American uh, nations. Uh, Judge Holden is a fearful uh, creature, if he is a creature, uh, one isn't quite sure. Um, when you last see him in the book, he is uh, simultaneously fiddling and wildly dancing in a uh, tavern, and he is proclaiming uh, that he will never die. And perhaps, indeed, uh, he never will die. Certainly. Uh, the answer to the first uh, would very much have to do with the two great uh, scholars, uh, the late Gershom Sholem, whom I saw a certain amount of both in Jerusalem and here, and a very close friend, his, uh, his very eminent successor, though they uh, not, not totally in sympathy with uh, Sholem, uh, Moshe Idel, I-D-E-L, but they, they are the two great modern scholars of the tradition, and uh, they have both of them uh, enormously uh, influenced me. Um, Kabbalah is uh, a very complex, I won't say a single method, it's a whole series of uh, methods of interpretation um, of at times uh, amazing variety and, and sometimes of uh, really dreadful uh, difficulty. I, I, I'm merely an amateur of it. Uh, uh, I, I, of course, cannot make uh, any contribution whatsoever to the uh, rigorous uh, study of it. I'm simply not uh, uh, qualified, but uh, certainly uh, the writings very freely available uh, in English of uh, Gershom Sholem and Moshe Idel uh, should be consulted. Uh, Emily Dickinson is beyond question with Walt Whitman, uh, still the greatest of all uh, of our country's poets. Uh, she also, uh, I would say, uh, unquestionably, uh, and it may be a surprising thing to say about any writer, but uh, I would suppose that uh, except for Shakespeare himself, and with the possible exception of uh, William Blake, uh, Dickinson must really uh, be judged as having about as original uh, and uh, inventive a mind uh, as anyone uh, in the whole of uh, Western literary tradition. She really has thought everything uh, through again for herself. Um, I've been teaching her for decades and decades and decades now. I still remember uh, one of my own teachers here at Yale was the late and much lamented by me, William K. Wimsett, who was a, a new critic, a uh, close friend and colleague of Clarence Brooks, and another old friend whom I very much miss, uh, Robert Penn Warren. <laughs> and I remember one day having coffee uh, with William Wimsett, who was always saying, from the time I was his student back in 1951 on, uh, that I was, uh, as he put it, too Longinian a critic, rather than a kind of Aristotelian uh, critic like himself. And he felt that I was much too affective uh, a critic and I had come in after a two-hour Dickinson seminar, and I had a violent headache. And he said, what's wrong with you, Harold? You keep frowning. And I said, I said, Bill, every time I've just spent two hours teaching Emily Dickinson, um, 
I get a, a violent headache because, you know, I've had to sort of work beyond uh, my own uh, cognitive reach. And he shook his head and said, well, he said, it, 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 it serves you right. <laughs> sure. Um, there is a powerful poem, a late poem, perhaps written after the death of her quite possible lover, in every sense of lover, a uh, Judge Otis Lord, who was much older than she was and had been a friend of her a late father, which begins, uh, because that you are going and never coming back, and I must overlook your track, and then, poor fellow, uh, as well that he didn't survive to read this, it would certainly wither me had I been Lord or whoever this was. Uh, she shakes her head and says, that you who were existence yourself forgot to live. Immensely telling. Well, uh, I must make things sound worse even than they are. Uh, there are many universities and colleges where this kind of transformation of the study of uh, imaginative literature into cultural studies uh, is by no means complete or in which rather uneasily uh, the two modes live side by side. And, you know, uh, at Yale, for instance, though, I can see the uh, inroads, particularly in American studies, which seems to me wholly gone. Uh, one of my research assistants last year came in to work with me one day, sort of shaking her head, and I, I said, what is it, dear? And she said, I just come from a two-hour seminar on Walt Whitman, which was entirely devoted to uh, the instructor telling us that Walt Whitman was a racist, at which one can only throw up one's hands. I mean, it's, it's, it's abominable and, and unforgivable, whoever that uh, teacher was. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to answer uh, your question. Uh, I don't think that uh, American undergraduates anywhere are uh, much enthralled by this kind of thing any more than the general public is. The media, I repeat, has been deeply contaminated by it. Um, it does comprise uh, a very considerable portion, and certainly in terms of university and college politics, usually the most active portion of what you might want to call the middle generation of the uh, faculties in most universities and colleges of the English-speaking world. It, it's actually further gone in uh, Great Britain and in uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, than it is here. Uh, whether it can ever be reversed, I suppose that after my time, uh, after all, I'm going to turn 73, as I said, uh, this coming July, um, though I hope to go on teaching uh, for quite a while to come, if I hold up, uh, I, I don't suppose that I will live to see uh, this uh, curious mode, as I would call it, uh, being replaced. I, I think that whole generation uh, uh, will stick to what are, after all, their sincere convictions, however mistaken I, I regard them as being. And uh, I, I don't know whether they will have uh, really uh, reproduced themselves or not. Uh, the fact that uh, I think undergraduates, I repeat, everywhere are so deeply alienated uh, from these modes uh, may indicate that in time uh, there will be a change, but I, I, I can't prophesy. Uh, this is, as you know, uh, we're coming very close to it. I think it's uh, sometime in later May, May 26th or so. Uh, this will be the uh, 
bicentenary uh, coming up of Emerson's uh, birth, and I actually wrote something for the uh, English newspaper, The Guardian, which is being published, is today May the 3rd? Ah, it's actually being published today uh, uh, in London, um, in which I tried to uh, brood about it. I saw a piece, in fact, uh, in today's Sunday Times on the op-ed page, uh, which I did not like uh, at all on uh, Emerson, uh, essentially blaming him for uh, our current uh, political situation. Uh, Emerson is uh, so endlessly varied, uh, and he is in such a curious kind of great-grandfather position in regard to both what you would have to call the American uh, intellectual and cultural left and the, uh, and the right, that uh, both, both can uh, properly assert that he is the ancestor. That is to say, if on the one hand, he was perhaps a dominant influence upon the first Henry Ford, on the other, he was certainly the dominant influence upon the uh, philosopher of education, John Dewey. Um, one can find him reverberating still in one of the best minds on the intellectual left that we have today, the philosopher Richard Rorty. Um, he is also, I think, one of the inaugurators of, I once wrote a book about this, which is going to come out again as an anchor book this spring, uh, probably the least understood thing I ever wrote called The American Religion. Uh, but I, I took the name of that both from uh, a report. Uh, one of the founders of Cornell University, uh, uh, Andrew Dixon White, was in the 19th century uh, our ambassador to Russia. And he records a conversation he had with uh, Count Tolstoy in which the uh, great writer says the Mormon people teach the American religion, which is a very striking and perhaps accurate thing to have said. And my late friend, alas, dead now for many years, the superb historian of American religion here at Yale, Sidney Alstrom. Um, Sidney, I remember writing in his very useful book, uh, A Religious History of the American People, he actually says at one point uh, that Emerson can really be called the theologian of what might be termed the American religion. Uh, Emerson's emphasis, of course, and he left uh, off being a uh, minister in the Unitarian Church. He resigned from it on this basis. He, he believed wholly in what he called the God within, which he identified, uh, he identified uh, very clearly with what he said was best and oldest. Uh, in every one of us, and that is uh, a notion which perhaps does amount to a kind of American gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, even if not quite to an American Gnosticism. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to have interrupted you. I, I, I just wondered at your use of the word history, uh, I, the question of the origins uh, of an author uh, is, is something that if possible, I, I, I like to set aside, if, if only because of current polemics. Uh, but uh, uh, go, go on with what you were saying. I'm sorry I interrupted. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, the, the Oxfordians call us Stratfordian. I, I was a little shocked by that for a uh, moment. No, uh, some years ago, my, my, my good friend Lewis Lapham, the, the editor of Harper's, uh, got me into a symposium, uh, uh, somewhat reluctantly on my part, on the whole, uh, Oxfordian uh, controversy, I, 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 I remain startled uh, that anyone should believe that Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare, though we have those who insist that uh, Aubrey de Vere, uh, the Earl of Oxford, wrote him. We have those who insist that Christopher Marlowe wrote him. We have those who, from time immemorial, almost have insisted that Sir Francis Bacon wrote him. Uh, uh, I, I can't, in the end, uh, bear any of this nonsense. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, after writing this piece and, and publishing it in Harper's, I called it a salvo for Lucy Negro, uh, she having been uh, 
course, these days might be called in the current parlance the leading East Indian sex worker of Elizabethan Jacobean uh, London, and by some accounts, the dark lady of the sonnets, uh, whether one wants to believe that or not. I, I said that I, I would just as soon believe that she had written all of Shakespeare, because unlike the Earl of Oxford, she at least had evidently slept with Shakespeare, at least according to my old acquaintance, uh, the novelist Anthony Burgess, in his quite wonderful uh, novel about Shakespeare called Nothing Like the Sun. But, but on the whole question uh, uh, of this, I, I, I think, nonsense, and I'm sure to get even more poison pen lettuce now, because I must say, the, these Oxfordians are very virulent, and forgive me for saying this, very crazy people indeed. You know, there is a society uh, in London which keeps sending me its literature, to call it that, which is devoted entirely to proving that all the works of Lewis Carroll were written by Queen Victoria. Uh, there's also the Flat Earth Society, uh, whose American founder died only recently. I, I think there's a great deal in common between those who want to prove that all of Lewis Carroll was written by Queen Victoria, and those who want to go on believing that the Earth is indeed flat, and those who desperately want to say that someone, anyone, uh, rather than William Shakespeare, wrote William Shakespeare. But thank you. Thank you. Um, Spencer, a very great poet, now alas, uh, much unread, uh, an enormous influence uh, upon uh, Milton. Indeed, Milton, perhaps a little too obligingly, told the poet John Dryden when Dryden called upon him to get Milton's permission to uh, turn Paradise Lost into rhyming couplets. Um, and Milton evidently, uh, somewhat ironically, uh, gave his uh, permission to Dryden. But Dryden says that on that occasion, Milton said to him that Spencer was my great original. And there is an enormous influence, certainly, of the Fairy Queen and of Spencer's so-called minor poems. They, they would be immensely major poems by any uh, standard. Uh, indeed, I never get the epithalamian. Uh, most majestic of uh, marriage songs uh, out of my inner ear. Um, oh, oh, there's only time for the first stanza, but I remember reciting it to myself the morning of my own wedding, 45 years ago this coming week. Ye learned sisters, which have oftentimes been to me aiding others to adorn, whom ye thought worthy of your graceful rhymes, that even the greatest did not greatly scorn to hear their names mirrored in thy lays, but joyed in their praise. And when ye list your own mishaps to mourn, which death or love or fortune's wreck did raise, your string could soon to sadder tenor turn and teach the woods and waters to lament your doleful jurament. Now lay all those sorrowful complaints aside, and having all your heads with garlands crowned, help me, mine own love's praises to resound. Now let the same of any be envied so Orpheus did for his own bride. So I unto myself alone will sing. The woods shall to me answer and my echo ring. I think I counted uh, because uh, Andrew uh, of your group asked me to count. It turned out to be 28. Well, you know, I, I, I don't feel that I have uh, any uh, particularly uh, valuable insights into any questions of national politics or, or statecraft or, or war. I, I'm just, you know, uh, another citizen uh, in that regard. Um, I, I think there obviously has been a kind of 
decline in uh, what I would certainly regard as older modes of uh, cultural literacy uh, in high places uh, uh, in the United States government and I'm afraid in the Congress uh, also. Um, but I, I, I just don't feel that I'm, uh, I'm qualified to say very much about that. I'm sorry. Well, I, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, it is the last too good a question. and I'm certainly not part of, uh, of that trend, uh, though there are immense puzzles as to what Shakespeare was indeed up to uh, with Shylock, who clearly, uh, to some degree, is perhaps the first major character in Shakespeare, to somehow get away from Shakespeare. Um, I, I think the enormous examples of that uh, would be Falstaff and then Hamlet, who is uh, <laughs> uh, so amazing a, a representation that uh, he seems to have uh, an existence uh, totally independent of uh, Shakespeare and the play. Um, what 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 um, intrigues me the most? It, it's always a uh, a problem. Uh, I, I mean, I teach uh, the Merchant of Venice uh, annually here at Yale, and. Uh, the problem that I try to confront with my students or have them confront is um, why, why did Shakespeare, uh, quite gratuitously, it, it was no part of the pound of flesh uh, tradition, it's not in any of his sources, why did he put Shylock through an enforced conversion uh, towards the close of the fourth act? And why, having had uh, Antonio, who is, after all, the merchant of Venice, state this to the uh, Duke or Doge of Venice as the condition or a major condition of uh, Shylock's survival, why does Shylock uh, consent? Uh, sort of instant baptism. Uh, uh, It destroys uh, any dramatic consistency, and there has been a great deal until then, a formidable uh, degree of it, uh, in Shylock's uh, character. Uh, it is impossible to be persuaded that uh, the figure whom Shakespeare has been giving us for four acts would show um, consent to uh, mere survival what it means uh, becoming a uh, Christian. I have never seen uh, an adequate explanation from any uh, Shakespearean critic, and I, I cannot provide one myself, as to why uh, Shakespeare did that. Uh, it is, after all, Portia's play. Uh, it is meant to be Portia's play. It is meant to be, and is, certainly in that ecstatic fifth act from which, of course, Shylock is necessarily excluded, it is a high romantic uh, comedy and an extraordinary and, and exuberant and successful one. Um, but what we are to make of Shylock, I'm not sure that anyone quite knows. Um, Perhaps Shakespeare set out with the notion that like the Barabbas of uh, Marlowe's The Jew of Malta, Shakespeare was to be a kind of uh, farcical villain, a sort of comic uh, villain. But of course, he is not that at all. And he most certainly is a villain. Uh, you know, the first time I ever saw The Merchant of Venice, uh, my sisters took me frequently to the uh, old Yiddish uh, theaters uh, on 2nd Avenue 
when I was a boy uh, in the later 30s and the very early uh, 40s. And I can never forget uh, the first Merchant of Venice I ever saw, which was uh, in Yiddish translation. I believe that Maurice Schwartz himself, the uh, major uh, tragic actor of the Second Avenue Yiddish Theater in those days, in, in succession to Jacob Adler, a great legend who was, however, before my time. Um, I believe that Schwartz, perhaps with assistance from others, had translated the play into Yiddish. Uh, his Shylock, of course, is not Shakespeare's Shylock, but it hovers in my head every time I see or teach the play. Um, towards the end of the fourth act, there is Shylock, scalpel in hand, uh, approaching the quite sensibly and properly uh, shrinking um, Antonio, in Schwartz's version, the one I first saw, as I said, uh, to cut off his pound of flesh in what, after all, would be a very grisly slaughter indeed. And suddenly, um, and Schwartz was a, a very considerable uh, melodramatic uh, actor, so uh, he, he certainly riveted all attention in the theater, my own youthful eyes uh, with the rest. Uh, upon him, suddenly, he, he, an enormous shudder passes through him, and he drops the knife and cries out in a piercing voice, Ich bin doch ein Jid, that is to say, but after all, uh, I am Jewish. And he will not do it. And of course, the audience rose and cheered, but they were purely a Jewish, indeed, a Yiddish uh, audience. That is certainly not the Shylock of William Shakespeare. But as to precisely who or what Shakespeare's Shylock is, I, I, still, cannot, I still cannot answer. Well, I, I don't really know very much about this. I, I am told that Yale uh, is involved with several other universities in a sort of consortium uh, uh, collaborating uh, on this. Uh, I have so little information about it, and I have not thought about it at all, so that I, I, I'm so, sorry, I just cannot be of much help, sir. Uh, no. Uh, have I? Yes, I suppose. Uh, in publicizing one book or another, I have been put online uh, with, with an interlocutor between myself and people sending in email, uh, but I have no clear memories of it. Um, my friend John Hollander, a few years back, a uh, very, uh, very fine poet indeed and wonderful uh, literary scholar, uh, particularly of the Renaissance, um, did a very good anthology called uh, Possessed by Memory, in which he offers, I believe it was 100 uh, really very good poems uh, that are very apt for memorization. Um, I used to, uh, in many of the courses that I taught uh, here at Yale, um, try to uh, get groups, both of graduate and undergraduate students, to sort of join me in experiments in uh, possession uh, by memory, uh, in which I would urge them never, of course, to memorize anything by rote, uh, but, you know, to read and reread, say, Tennyson's Ulysses, a uh, very great dramatic monologue, which is very available, I think, for uh, such possession, uh, you know, to read it out loud to themselves or to others so many times that finally, uh, they did begin to possess it for themselves, but then, then I got shy of it and uh, felt, well, it was perhaps an imposition upon the students uh, on my part. Um, I wish I hadn't gotten uh, shy of it. Perhaps now, in brazen old age, I will return to it if my students will tolerate it. But, but thank you. Yes, I, 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 I'm afraid that my poor neighbors, perhaps rightly, considered me uh, somewhat mad, uh, somewhat insane, uh, but I was, you know, I was so intoxicated with it, I, I, I was drunk on it, um, and of course <laughs> was making a spectacle uh, of myself. Um, I, I, I don't do that anymore. I, I tend, unless I'm absolutely alone outdoors or indoors, 
I must say I had an odd experience. Uh, I, I had this open heart operation uh, somewhere between six and seven months ago and was a very long time uh, recovering from this three-way bypass. Indeed, as is, I think, customary with so invasive an operation, uh, the aftermath uh, involved a great deal of uh, profound depression on my part, which is, I guess, not to be avoided. And part of the problem, as they told me, was that in the uh, trauma of the operation, uh, as, as does so frequently happen, uh, my heart had gone into a very irregular rhythm indeed, and they couldn't correct it until I'd spent a certain amount of time on medication. And about two months ago, uh, after they'd brought me into the uh, Yale New Haven Hospital again uh, for three or four days and nights and uh, knocked me out at one point for an hour and a half and with this rather interesting uh, electrified paddle, I believe, which they actually press on your heart front and back, they had restored a, uh, a heartbeat and I still felt rather miserable when uh, my wife kindly took me home uh, that weekend but early the next week at one point when she was out of the house, I suppose it was simply because uh, physiologically I had a regular heartbeat again, I suddenly, uh, after so many months of uh, feeling miserable, felt alive and well. And without even realizing that I was doing it, I went and stood over there in that doorway and for about an hour and a half or so until my wife came home, I, I simply chanted, uh, quite exultantly, uh, a great many of my favorite poems out loud to myself. Uh, <laughs> seems to me now a, an odd kind of moment, but uh, certainly worth, for my own sake, recalling that because it does remind me of uh, what a good thing it is to return to life. Um, Pynchon may or may not be a novelist, but that's because he is something larger and more wonderful even than a great novelist. He, he writes epic sagas uh, uh, almost without uh, parallel. It would be very difficult uh, to compare any single figure uh, except perhaps the Cormac McCarthy of Blood Meridian uh, to him, though. Certainly, uh, Philip Roth and Don DeLillo are, are major novelists. Um, Gravity's Rainbow uh, is a superb work. Uh, one brief section of it, the story of Byron, the light bulb, I never got out of my head or heart. Uh, it is so wonderful about a uh, light bulb <laughs> named Byron, wonderful name for him after, no doubt, Lord Byron, George Gordon, Lord Byron the remarkable romantic poet and personality of the early 19th century. Uh, Byron is a light bulb who is uh, programmed by R.G. Farben or whatever to burn out. And he defies this system by simply refusing to burn out. And they punish him in various ways. He ends up, poor light bulb, uh, in the uh, bathroom of a rather low-grade uh, bordello, I believe it's in Hamburg, uh, uh, still burning on uh, resolutely, but rather miserably. Uh, uh, v and Gravity's Rainbow seem to me less as achievements than uh, the extraordinary uh, early novel which came between those two books, uh, The Crying of Lot 49, which is a superb shot out of hell, as it were, and uh, a book I cannot reread too often. Or uh, after a rather unfortunate book called, I think it was uh, Vineland, which, which I, I could barely believe was by uh, Pynchon, uh, uh, an immense return uh, to his full uh, dazzlement in the great book called Mason and uh, Dixon, I, I would think his finest single achievement, but, but thank you. Oh, I, I, I will go back uh, resolutely and, and I will teach. <laughs> I, I collapsed. Uh, upstairs shaving on September the 4th, a Wednesday, uh, when I was supposed to go into Yale and teach my first Shakespeare class of the year. Uh, I'll teach uh, 
uh, a course that goes through the year uh, for undergraduates uh, on all of Shakespeare or what you can of course get all and even in uh, 26 sessions or so so it will be perhaps two dozen of the uh, 38 or so plays you know the two dozen that, that seem to me uh, most extraordinary uh, and then in the fall term uh, I'll give a uh, undergraduate seminar on really how to read a poem and in the spring, uh, a mixed graduate and undergraduate course on major American poets, and at NYU in the autumn term, a, a graduate course on trying to bring together uh, my sense of what literary criticism might be uh, with a series of modern American uh, poets. Uh, no, uh, my wife pointed out to me a few years ago that whenever I prepared too intensively, I would come home shaking my head, very unhappy indeed, because uh, I felt the classes had gone very badly. Uh, uh, you know, since, since I have by heart, in every sense I think of having by heart, though uh, <laughs> the term now troubles me after all my recent uh, problems with my heart, um, <laughs> in the physiological sense and the clinical sense, um, no, I, I, I seem best off, uh, I mean, I, I always reread, of course, uh, the Shakespearean play or, or the particular poem, uh, be it by Whitman or Dickinson or Wallace Stevens or Hart Crane or, or John Ashbery, uh, that I'm going to be teaching. Uh, but uh, I, I, I seem, I, I, I don't know what sort of a teacher I am anyway. I. Um, I guess one reason why I, I really want to go on is because uh, quite clearly um, there are very inadequate things uh, in my performance as a teacher. I am not very good at uh, encouraging uh, class discussion and helping it carry itself uh, along. I still have the old Talmudical habit of uh, asking questions and then answering them by my own questions and doing it too quickly. Um, so I hope I can slow myself down and uh, learn to listen uh, a little better. I, I think I have been, uh, I don't know whether I would say sobered or, or humbled or whatever, but I, 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 I think I'm undergoing a, a change uh, uh, because of this. Uh, I mean, it's been a bad year. Uh, it started with terrible arthritic attacks and then there was this dreadful bleeding ulcer in September, which turned out to be a fortunate thing because they discovered that uh, I was not going to last m more than a few weeks unless they indeed uh, replaced all the uh, arteries that carry blood down to the heart. But uh, it has obviously changed me in, in ways that I don't uh, fully understand as yet. Indeed, a couple of friends who are very good physicians uh, have pointed out to me that it really does take eight to ten months, sometimes a year, after a really invasive operation of any kind before the trauma uh, is really gone. But uh, th there is uh, a considerable uh, influence uh, in translation, of course, of uh, Hindu scriptures and indeed of uh, also uh, Persian literature, uh, Persian poetry. First upon Goethe uh, in Germany, uh, in his old age, who wrote uh, marvelous poems uh, in the Chinese and in the Persian mode. Uh, and then uh, Emerson and Thoreau, who uh, were deeply imbued with, uh, by contemporary translations of uh, the major uh, Hindu uh, scriptures, uh, I, I must admit that it's an aspect of uh, transcendentalism that I myself uh, understand very imperfectly uh, indeed, uh, though I uh, have tried to uh, read in translations, of course, Hindu uh, scriptures as well as uh, the major uh, Buddhist scriptures. Uh, I never have the sense that uh, 
I really achieve uh, a useful understanding of them. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not able to accomplish that. So I, I, I'm afraid uh, I, I can't be of any help. Oh, uh, I'm just fascinated, forgive me, uh, <laughs> by seeing uh, my study like that. Um, I don't know that anyone has uh, sort of gone into it before like that. Um, uh, uh, there are a number of reasons. I, uh, I have an honorary degree from St. Michael's. Uh, I have a former student whom I enormously value uh, there, uh, now emeritus, uh, Professor John Rice, a uh, very devoted uh, scholar teacher of uh, American literature, um, someone whom I've loved since he was a child, uh, Nathaniel Lewis, uh, the son of my, alas, uh, recently uh, deceased friend, the superb uh, scholar of American literature, uh, R.W.B. Lewis, uh, Dick Lewis. And we've always been very close uh, to him, to his wife Nancy, and to the uh, three children. Um, but I, I had been thinking, you know, um, it won't be immediate, of course, that they have to build uh, in addition to their library, though they, I think, have now received part of the money that they, from an anonymous donor among their alumni, so they'll be able to start the process. But uh, I suppose in, in five to seven years uh, it will exist, and sort of gradually one can transfer uh, all but a sort of working part uh, of my library to them. Uh, it, it would be... Uh, you know, I think uh, purely gratuitous uh, to offer one's personal library uh, to Yale University, which has one of the four great libraries uh, uh, in the United States, together with Harvard, the, the Library of Congress, and the major library at 42nd Street, the New York Public Library um, in New York, um, or indeed even to offer it to my original alma mater, Cornell University, because, you know, Perhaps a few hundred of the books uh, could be housed there uh, because they are rare books or you know, join the rare books that they have. But most of them uh, would be of no use or interest to them. Uh, but uh, to a place which is a small place with a relatively small library allowed, like St. Michael's, which does, uh, like a number of... Uh, I, I by no means know that this is all, but a number of, uh, certainly Notre Dame University and the Catholic University of America, where I know something about the uh, teaching of literature, have maintained very high standards. Again, I would say aesthetic and cognitive uh, in the uh, teaching of literature. So has uh, St. Michael's, uh, a small place. So I, I just thought it would be more useful uh, to put it there and to... Uh, uh, Flannery uh, O'Connor is clearly a, a writer for the, uh, the ages, uh, uh, deeply disquieting and uh, at times very scary and surprising writer, but uh, yeah, of lupus, I don't think she had reached 40 years old, to the best of my, uh, my knowledge. Um, oh, this would have been, if I have it right, I may have it wrong now, uh, surely back in the 1940s and 50s. I, I, I cannot recall uh, uh, when she died. Um, but the uh, the two novels, Wise Blood and the even more disconcerting and uh, <laughs> immensely rewarding um, novel, The Violent Bear It Away, um, are permanent achievements and as a story writer, uh, she rivals uh, Ernest Hemingway uh, in modern American uh, fiction. She does not resemble him at all, of course, since she is quite passionately Southern Gothic uh, and indeed defended uh, being in that uh, kind. Um, uh, I must admit to imperfect uh, 
sympathies there. I, I, I've read at one time or another uh, a vast quantity of Graham Greene's, the early novel called Brighton Rock. Uh, I found very impressive, a kind of throwback to uh, Jacobean tragedy to John Webster or Cyril Turner or John Ford and uh, a very uh, striking and memorable book. Uh, certainly there are some short stories that are very fine, but I, I did not know how I felt about the still very impressive book, uh, The Power and the Glory, about a fugitive uh, Mexican uh, priest in post-revolutionary uh, Mexico. Though it, it, it is a, a very serious and uh, I, I just felt equivocal about it. Uh, much of green uh, leaves me feeling uh, very mixed, but uh, that, that can be a purely subjective uh, kind of reaction. Uh, certainly Brighton Rock uh, rises above any, uh, any qualms. Uh, I guess I don't like the end of the affair, uh, which seems to me contrived and uh, somehow theologically tendentious. If St. Augustine very great mind, a uh, very great reader, very great teacher of how to read. Uh, if St. Augustine is tendentious, one says, well, of course, and uh, <laughs> one is still immensely grateful for the experience of rereading him continually. But when Graham Greene is tendentious, that is to say, when he has too clear a design upon the reader, I, I do become very uneasy. I... I find what you're saying surprising. I remember that Hamlet says, as kill a king and marry with my mother. Uh, though I may have that wrong now also. I may be getting confused, but that doesn't sound quite right to me, sir. Uh, Shakespeare in Love was a... Uh, I did see uh, Shakespeare in Love simply because uh, somebody came to the house with a tape of it. Uh, A young woman, I think, from either Time or Newsweek. Um, it certainly is a a delightful film. Um, with, with sort of obvious limitations, but then uh, Tom Stoppard, I believe, uh, was one of the uh, scriptwriters, and it, it has something of his verve and uh, wonderful wit. Um, I, I don't know what to make of the uh, Brannock, uh movies. Um, he has enormous intensity uh, as an actor. Um, I'm not quite sure that I, I can fully recognize any of the plays in what he, uh, in what he does. I, I remember a, a few years ago uh, being at the 92nd Street Y with very distinguished uh, English literary uh, Critic, um, a Manxman, indeed, uh, Sir Frank Kermode, and that uh, some in the audience asked this, and I said, "Well, I, I, I really thought that the uh, Akira Kurosawa films, uh, Ron, I believe it's called, which is his version of King Lear, and Throne of Blood, I think it was called uh, in English, which is his." very striking version of uh, Macbeth, somehow struck me a as more authentically Shakespearean than any other film Shakespeare I had seen, at which uh, Sir Frank observed somewhat mordantly that I didn't uh, seem to care that nothing of Shakespeare's language uh, could possibly appear in, in such films. And I uh, agreed that Sir Frank had uh, scored a splendid point upon me, but nevertheless, uh, I stuck to it and still stick to it. Uh, somehow, uh, Kurosawa seemed to me to be closer to the heart of the matter, to use that Graham Greenian phrase, uh, somewhat ironically, than uh, any other film Shakespeare that I've seen. The, the 
uh, there are a great many uh, powerful influences on Scott Fitzgerald, who is great Gatsby. As, I mean, one is happy to uh, concur with the common reader, as, as Dr. Johnson uh, says, uh, is a magnificent uh, short novel that, that time does not in any way uh, stale or dim, and the best of whose uh, short stories, like the infinitely sad uh, Babylon Revisited, always stay uh, with me also, and I, I, I would think with most uh, readers. Um, there's a lot of Joseph Conrad uh, in Scott Fitzgerald, as there is, of course, also in Hemingway and in the greatest figure of that generation, or surely of all of modern American literature, uh, William Faulkner. I mean, just as I said earlier, that if I had to vote for a single work by a living American, it would be a Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. If I had to think of the last century, a single work by an American, it would be Faulkner's short novel, As I Lay Dying. Uh, Conrad's uh, use of the... Uh, mediating narrator, whom he so frequently calls Marlowe, without an E at the end of it, M-A-R-L-O-W, uh, is brilliantly uh, modulated and picked up on uh, by Scott Fitzgerald in uh, Nick Carraway, who relates uh, Gatsby's story uh, to us. And of course, the the rhetorical effect of uh, T.S. Eliot's poetry, particularly of the wasteland, is very strong upon the great Gatsby. So is a very different poet indeed, and of course, an infinitely greater one. I, I don't say that out of even my admittedly uh, ambivalent reaction to Eliot's poetry, but John Keats, uh, whose Ode to a Nightingale, which is of course utilized for the wonderful title of that sort of mixed success as a book, Tender is the Night. Um, Keats's odes uh, are always being echoed quite deliberately uh, in Scott uh, Fitzgerald. Um, I, I guess that's what I could say at the moment. Thank you. Oh, well, I have recently lost 55 pounds. Uh, I would never dream of trying to play Hamlet, nor would anyone be foolish enough to let me do it. Uh, I must lose another 50-odd pounds, but that I think will take about a year. Some years ago, I, I actually did, thanks to the kindness of a wonderful uh, Shakespearean director and a close friend, uh, Karen Coonrod, C-O-O-N-R-O-D, and of my old friend Robert Brewstein, uh, I actually did play uh, Falstaff uh, at the American Repertory Theatre uh, up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We took the two parts of Henry the Fourth. There's actually a photograph of it somewhere. Oh, oh, that, that, that is the great, that is the greatest of all actors that I've ever seen. That that is Sir Rafe Richardson, uh, whose Falstaff uh, I saw back in 1946 or 47, and it has never ceased to be. Uh, an overwhelming influence on me. I, I think I played uh, Foster more briefly, uh, more briefly, uh, twice. Uh, alas, one, one is neither Falstaff uh, nor Hamlet. Um, here's Eliot coming to haunt me again, winning his own triumph over me from uh, the love song of J. Alfred Proop Frock, uh, undoubtedly a great poem. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, no, is meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Thank you. Well, uh, Miss Carson, uh, very clearly, uh, she brings them into her poetry, uh, very clearly has a strong relationship both to Emily Dickinson and to Emily Bronte both the Bronte of uh, Wuthering Heights, but the um, very uh, fine uh, lyric and, and meditative poems uh, of Emily Bronte. 
Um, it's an interesting question that you ask. Uh, I, I am not much moved by the poetry of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, even though uh, she is very strongly put forward by uh, feminist literary critics these days. Christina Rossetti, uh, though, is, I think, a major poet, uh, particularly uh, a great devotional poet uh, by any uh, legitimate standards. Uh, I find myself rereading her all the time. Uh, I don't know uh, why. Uh, I mean, one, one thinks of the major modern British poets. Uh, I mean, there are the Irish poets, of course. So one, one thinks of the whole succession from William Butler Yeats through Seamus Heaney uh, on to others. Uh, a very uh, strong tradition indeed. Uh, there is the poetry of Thomas Hardy. Um, there was Edward Thomas, who, when he was really much too old for it, went and got himself killed in the First World War, thus cutting off uh, an immense potential. There were two great younger poets killed in the First World War, uh, Wilfred Owen and Isaac Rosenberg. Um, and of course, there is alive and now living in this country, uh, Jeffrey Hill. But I, I, I cannot account for why uh, there does not seem to me to be uh, a major uh, modern uh, British or Irish poet uh, who happens to be a woman. Well, Ralph Waldo Emerson at one point says, only write a dozen lines and rest on your oars forever. Uh, and there are indeed uh, poets remembered for the one poem, simply because that one poem is surpassing enough so we cannot uh, get rid of it. Uh, I suppose in a way I want to change the question. Uh, Sometimes what puzzles and fascinates me most about Shakespeare is that while, you know, insofar as they are comparable writers, one would have to think of Dante, um, Cervantes, Chaucer, Tolstoy. Um, they all go on uh, in their old age. They, as Cervantes says, uh, they remain in the stirrup. But Shakespeare who dies just about on his 52nd birthday, does not seem to have written a line in the last three and a half years of his life. He collaborates on the two noble kinsmen with his replacement in his company, a John Fletcher. And then he will not write anything uh, more. Until then he had been, of course, immensely prolific, uh, 38 or so plays in just 25 years. Indeed, there is one other thing in Shakespeare that always stuns me. Uh, in 14 consecutive months, he wrote uh, King Lear, Macbeth, and Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, I, I can't understand that. I can't, I can't somehow get around that. It, it just seems superhuman. It, it seems impossible that someone should have been able to do that, but he did. Thank you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. One, one of my favorite literary critics and, and one of my favorite uh, writers in general. The Man Who Was Thursday is a great uh, prose romance, which... I reread nearly every year, but, but Chesterton was also, I think, just about a great literary critic. Uh, to this day, uh, his books on Dickens, on Robert Browning, certainly those two, and some others uh, seem to me as good, certainly, as anyone has done uh, 
at any length on Charles Dickens or Robert Browning, uh, a great, of course, controversialist, uh, also an exuberant uh, writer to every degree, uh, a wonderful poet in that uh, great rollicking battle poem, uh, La Ponto, um, which has a marvelous vision in it of Cervantes there on deck in the great uh, sea fight where one of those rare rivals to Shakespeare was maimed forever. Uh, uh, I, I would want to chant the whole thing. Uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's a narrative poem, and uh, it's not primarily uh, lyrical. Uh, um, I... I, 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 I I don't think uh, it would work, and I wouldn't know uh, where to break off. I, I'd never get out of my head uh, Chesterton's uh, wonderful ballad about Noah, who is, of course, uh, drunken on, uh, dr drunk on deck. Uh, and the refrain of the poem is, I don't care where the water goes if it doesn't get into the wine, uh, which is, I think, one of the great lines. Uh, in 20th century uh, English poetry. But I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that for now. Uh, I, I, I assume, sir, that, that, that you grew up uh, with the King James uh, or, or authorized version of the Bible, most of which uh, was written by, except for Geoffrey Chaucer, I, I, I would think, uh, Someone who comes close uh, comes closest to being uh, uh, authentically uh, uh, of Shakespeare's greatness. That is William Tyndale, uh, T Y N D A L E, who, who is the, the the principal translator. Though there's also Miles Coverdale, C O V E R D A L E, uh, very eminent. Uh, also, uh, uh, I, I'm not quite sure that I would agree uh, that even Shakespeare. Uh, could write uh, more powerfully than William Tyndale. In Tyndale's uh, Bible, in his uh, version of the story of Joseph, unfortunately, it vanishes in King James, even though they use so much of Tyndale. There's a wonderful uh, sentence, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a lucky fellow, uh, which is superb and, and worthy of uh, Shakespeare. Um, uh, the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament, and uh, certainly of all translations, the line of translations uh, that goes from Tyndale to the group who put together the authorized version uh, uh, is certainly uh, the only uh, work in Western tradition, though there's also, of course, uh, the Koran, which is... Uh, a very, uh, very extraordinary work indeed, uh, which has a unique advantage. I cannot think of any other book uh, which is like this. Uh, one hears only the voice of the God in it. Uh, literally no one else speaks except, uh, except God. And that, uh, that is quite a recitation. Um, you know, the famous desert island question. Uh, someone once asked James Joyce if on a desert island and you could have only the one book, uh, what would it be? And he replied uh, famously, uh, and I think this is verbatim, I should like to answer Dante, but I would have to take the Englishman because he is richer. Wonderful word to use there, and of course he means Shakespeare rather ruefully, and of course from an Irish point of view he is being charmingly uh, and wittily resentful of Shakespeare's uh, priority, though certainly in Finnegan's Wake uh, he does, I think, as much with countering the influence of Shakespeare as any writer in the language has been able uh, to do. If I were asked the Desert Island question, it would be very hard to know. I mean, the, the answers 
would have to be, you know, the complete Shakespeare, the complete Hebrew Bible and Greek New Testament, whether in the original or either in Tyndale's or the authorized uh, version, certainly Dante, certainly uh, Cervantes, very hard ultimately uh, to choose. Well, there is a powerful uh, critical tradition in English, which includes, of course, uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson, uh, William Hazlitt in the uh, age of high romanticism, that is to say the time of Wordsworth and Shelley. Um, I am myself addicted to the criticism, to the prose of uh, the great aesthetic uh, critic, uh, Walter Pater. There is Emerson, overwhelmingly, in American literature, the great American essayist, certainly, and a disciple of the greatest of all essayists, uh, Montaigne. Um, It's a difficult question to answer. There are great masterpieces of uh, history in English. There is Gibbon's uh, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which, of course, is in a melancholy way in the mind of many of us these days as we worry about this rather imperial moment in the history of the United States uh, and what it may or may not presage. Um, there is David Hume, uh, of all philosophers uh, in English, the one who writes uh, most powerfully, and of course a very powerful historian uh, also. I guess I, I would let it go uh, at that for the moment. Thank you. So the last part of what you were saying is a very deep matter. Well, it was my second near-death experience, uh, the first one which took place uh, when I was just about at my 60th birthday when a bleeding also ne nearly finished me off. Then I behaved stupidly. Uh, I can't afford to behave that stupidly again. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, as I said, I, I fear that I am still not wholly myself. Uh, I probably am still partly traumatized. Uh, I think they're even more precious to me. I, I'm very glad indeed uh, to be alive. Uh, I was very, very moved when about, must be six or seven weeks ago, I went down to New York City for the first time in, I think, 10 or 11 months and uh, started to speak in public again uh, four nights in a row. Uh, uh, ending up with an appearance with uh, Charlie Rose, and then we came back here, and then uh, we went out a lot uh, to Washington, D.C., where I had the great pleasure of uh, talking to Brian Lamb again, and to Baltimore, and to uh, Boston, and so on. Uh, very glad to be alive, uh, very glad to be addressing live audiences again. Uh, I don't know, Susan. It, it, it's such a complex question. I, if I'm fortunate enough to get to meet you again in a year or so, I'll, I'll be better able to answer it. A, at the moment, I think I'm still a little overwhelmed uh, by it all. I, 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 uh, I, I'm well aware that uh, I have a great many non-admirers. Uh, some of them, I would say, ideological, but uh, that is to say, either people whom I have perhaps unfairly called the school of resentment or uh, neoconservatives, since uh, I must admit, uh, neoconservatives and I loathe one another. I, 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 I find them quite unbearable, uh, and they find me uh, much the same, and good that we reciprocate in that regard. But also, I, I think there are a lot of uh, readers, good, bad, and indifferent readers, uh, who find me rather overbearing, I, I gather. Uh, 
There are a lot of reviewers who certainly don't care for me at all. So I will now quote my two favorite aphorisms from the wonderful uh, German aphorist Lichtenberg, who came just before uh, Goethe uh, about book reviewing, since he had been savaged by book reviewers. They're both very famous, so the second is even better than the first. The first goes, uh, a book is a mirror. Uh, if an ape gazes into it, he shouldn't expect to see an angel. But far better, uh, and I tend to repeat it uh, all too often, uh, when a book and a reviewer's head collide and we hear a hollow sound, is it always the book's fault? Invariably, and uh, uh, the Macourt, as one calls him, as he calls himself, in his more ebullient moments, uh, I've met him only twice, most recently in Washington, D.C., uh, before that one day with uh, Sandy McClatchy and the late uh, James Merrill in New York City. Uh, uh, McCourt uh, does cause one to uh, go to the dictionary very frequently, but it, it always does me uh, good. I, I, I find him a wonderful writer, kind of throwback to a great, mostly now uh, forgotten Edwardian novelist, uh, Ronald Furbank, F-I-R-B-A-N, uh, 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 immensely witty, my court, um, in a volume called Time Remaining of uh, three short novels some years back, uh, also poignant because it is about his loss of friends to the uh, malady of AIDS. But thank you. I don't think I said quite that. I, I, I did say that I thought that uh, he was one of the few recent cases of a uh, Nobel Prize for Literature that was totally deserved. And his sequence of novels that I've written about a couple of times, uh, I find very impressive indeed. Oh, well, this uh, George Eliot is... Uh, Certainly together with Charles Dickens and Jane Austen and Samuel Richardson, uh, the author of Clarissa, uh, I, I would think the four major novelists in the English language, Trollope is always, always good to read, morning, morning night uh, or, or any other time. Uh, There is a, an account of Trollope, which I absolutely believe you know, he commuted into London. I don't know whether he worked at the East India office, I may have that wrong, but he, he worked as a uh, civil servant uh, in London. And he was, of course, prolific. And evidently, if, say, at 8.42 a.m., riding the train in, he finished a novel... Um, he would turn over the full cab page and uh, half a moment later simply begin the next novel. Uh, and yet all, all of uh, permanent quality. Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't judge that, uh, Susan. That's for you and Brian Lamb and, and your uh, colleagues uh, to judge. Um, I, I'm not sure I have the uh, insight. Uh, <sighs> no, the answer has to be mixed, I'm afraid. Uh, we hope that we are and will remain a democracy. Sometimes these days, I fear that we are closer to a plutocracy than to a democracy, or perhaps to an oligarchy. Um, if we are to survive as a democracy, we had better have uh, very 
intelligent uh, citizens. Um, thinking, so far as I can understand, is really a process one learns this, of course, from Augustine, uh, deeply reliant upon memory. So the next question is, well, what is it that people ought to remember that will help them think better? And I would answer uh, Shakespeare. I would answer John Milton. Uh, I would answer George Eliot. Um, I don't think I'm being too idealizing when I say that. Well, um, John Ashbery, uh, the poet Mark Strand, uh, would certainly be another. Uh, he has a very admirable long poem called Dark Harbor, which tries to meet a uh, the whole question of Stevens's influence upon him by quite overtly uh, recalling it and uh, perhaps working in the mode of a poem like The Auroras of Autumn or An Ordinary Evening in uh, New Haven. And there are, of course, others. Perhaps the most uh, interesting and uh, strongest example of this, someone who could superbly meet it, was Elizabeth Bishop, where uh, in a late poem like The End of March, she seems very subtly to be engaging some of Stevens's major tropes and metaphors and uh, undoing them from her own uh, perspective. Thank you. Um, I think I started reading Shakespeare, uh, starting with, uh, Romeo and Juliet and going on immediately, uh, to Macbeth, uh, I don't know, it, it must have been, uh, at that point I must have been about, uh, 11 perhaps, uh, and after that, uh, it was continuous, but it changed after, uh, when I think I was 16, uh, uh, I did see uh, the old Vic in the two parts of uh, Henry IV uh, in New York City uh, with Rafe Richardson as Falstaff, and of course, both parts. They did uh, part one as a matinee, and then the second part in the evening, and Laurence Olivier with Superb uh, versatility, playing the part of uh, Hotspur uh, in the afternoon and then becoming uh, just as shallow uh, in the evening. I, I, I think uh, that permanently changed the way uh, I read Shakespeare. Um, I suppose, uh, thank you, sir. I, I suppose that the highest mode of literature, be it the Bible or Shakespeare or Chaucer or Dante, in, in some sense, is a kind of vindication of uh, natural law. Um, um, I'm not uh, a legal scholar in any way, so I, I, I cannot really uh, comment on uh, the entire tradition of uh, natural law. Um, it fascinates me uh, in its relationship to someone like Augustine, um, who of course knows of and argues for a higher law, uh, revelation. Uh, but while, while the question is of enormous interest in itself, I'm not particularly competent uh, to say much about it. Uh, I, I think I would agree with my friend Ro Roger Shattuck that uh, Proust in one sense is for all ages. I mean, he is certainly uh, with Joyce, uh, the greatest Western writer of the century, 
just passed. Uh, it, it, it's, I think, true. Uh, oh, uh, in the original, perhaps just twice, uh, in the two different English versions, particularly uh, Terence Kilmartin's uh, reworking of the Scott Moncrief uh, version. Uh, I, I couldn't count uh, how many uh, times. Uh, and it's like asking how many times one has read Shakespeare or Chaucer. It, it is, I think, quite true that, uh, I don't know about more mature, but the older you get, the more you have experienced. Uh, as with Shakespeare, since Proust is a, a writer almost indeed comparable, if not indeed fully comparable, uh, it does get richer and richer as you, uh, as you go along. You know, I, I, I would neither try to teach Shakespeare nor begin to write about him until uh, I was well past uh, 35. I, I just felt that I was not ready, um, that I didn't know uh, anything well enough, including myself well enough. Uh, so I, I really just began to uh, fully teach him and uh, write extensively about him when I was in my late 40s or early 50s. Uh, still, he, after all, as Proust does also, he deals with what uh, Shakespeare calls the seven ages of man, meaning men and women, are. One, one always keeps coming back to both. No, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think I mi misled you a little. Uh, 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 my, my, my protest was against the uh, current fashion of uh, insisting that we really begin with uh, the ethnic origin, the, the, the so-called race, the, uh, the gender, the sexual orientation, um, and so on of a writer, uh, which doesn't work with me at all. But um, the, the biography of great writers uh, is, of course, uh, of overwhelming uh, interest, and I uh, I'm a determined reader of literary biography from its first masterpiece and perhaps its greatest masterpiece, uh, Boswell's Life of Dr. Samuel Johnson, uh, through the late uh, Richard Ellman, who was a good personal friend and who left us with uh, great biographies of uh, James Joyce and Oscar Wilde, the Wilde being perhaps uh, Dick Ellman's masterpiece. Uh, uh, and uh, Adele's uh, series of uh, biographies uh, uh, of James are uh, wonderfully done, and I, I've learned a great deal uh, from them. Uh, they're not definitive, but then I, I don't know how you could have a uh, definitive biography of Henry James because he uh, he is so uh, grand a writer that, uh, and of course, uh, wrote uh, some marvelous uh, autobiographical volumes also, but uh, he's so perfect and finished a writer, so great a reviser of himself. He, he perhaps does uh, present too great a challenge to any potential biographer. I am I'm a fanatical Yankee fan, and indeed when we are done uh, today, I will dash over to the television set to see how we are doing uh, this afternoon. Uh, I was taken when I was six years old back in 1936 by another much lamented uncle to uh, my first baseball game. We lived only nine or ten blocks from the uh, stadium in those days. And it was the summer of 1936, and actually the left fielder that year, if 
my memory is right, I think he switched to centre field in 1937 for the rest of his career, was Mr. Joseph Paul DiMaggio. Uh, uh, excellent to watch, of course, uh, at any time from then on. And uh, I have been a confirmed uh, Yankee fan uh, ever since, but as I sometimes find myself saying, uh, Yankee fans are perhaps so fanatical that they shouldn't be called uh, baseball fans. Indeed, these days, when I am somewhat disaffected by uh, the New York Times, which nevertheless my wife reads faithfully when it's delivered every morning, usually uh, I just read uh, the story out of the Yankees and then give up. Well, there have been various middling to good uh, baseball novels, but no, no great one that I remember. I'm not sure there is a, a single short story of um, really magnificent quality about baseball. Um, Marianne Moore wrote one fairly good poem about uh, baseball, about the Brooklyn Dodgers, I believe. But uh, it's not necessarily vintage uh, Marianne Moore. It's not like, say, her great poem called Marriage. No, it, 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 it didn't sort of uh, burn into me sufficiently so that I can recall very much of it. Uh, uh, the latter author is certainly uh, profoundly entertaining, uh, very readable. I, I don't know that I know him well enough to say much more than that. Uh, I, I have something of a problem uh, with Mr. Updike. We, we are not a mutual admiration society. I, I'll let it go with that. Well, uh, the idea of the sublime, uh, you know, being upon the heights, uh, goes back to the Perry Hoopsos, uh, the Hellenistic uh, critical work by the writer tradition calls Longinus. Uh, and the idea of the sublime, upon which Anne Carson uh, has written a uh, very strong uh, recent uh, both poems and prose, um, it has become uh, a very difficult literary category to uh, evoke or perhaps uh, fully to understand uh, Certainly, uh, Emily Dickinson, when she writes her poems, sometimes highly ironic about what she calls transport, uh, is very much playing with the mode of the sublime. Uh, Wallace Stevens has a poem of self-mockery called The American Sublime. And of course, if you're going to speak about an American sublime, you necessarily go back to Emerson who is the theorist of the American sublime. Uh, I, I, I like the question very much because uh, it brings up the uh, crucial matter of what is the relationship between imaginative literature and the deep desire that I think most men and women have um, for some kind of transcendence, uh, for um, some sense of what William Wordsworth uh, called effort and expectation and desire and something ever more about to be. That sense of uh, wanting more than even the most intense natural or erotic experience uh, can bring us that sense of uh, wishing what Wordsworth calls uh, something uh, more sublimely uh, infused um, must finally be uh, what most of us uh, who read incessantly are looking for in literature. Um, Certainly, uh, 
Shakespeare and the Bible and Dante afford more instances of these sublime. When I was very ill and in the hospital, self-dramatizer as evidently certain persons regard me as being, I found myself uh, endlessly repeating inwardly to myself perhaps the most sublime passage I sometimes think in all of Shakespeare uh, in Measure for Measure where the Duke who is pretending to be a friar is advising young Claudio who do for execution it is after all a comedy with one of the strangest if not the strangest of all comedies are uh, He's about to be executed for the great crime of fornication uh, and have gotten, uh, gotten with child, a lady to whom, in fact, he is betrothed to be married. And uh, the mock friar says to him, you know, how are you in effect? And Claudio replies, I have hope to live and I'm prepared to die. And you get the devastating speech, which is, I think as much of the sublime as one can have, be absolute for death. Either death or life shall thereby seem the sweeter. Reason thus with life. If I do lose thee, I would lose a thing that none but fools would cherish. Merely thou art death's fall. For him thou laborst by thy flight to shun, and yet runs toward him still. And then there's this, this is a, more than overwhelming. Thou hast nor youth nor age, but as it were, and after dinner, sleep, dreaming on both. That, that seems to me to articulate a kind of sense of the sublime uh, almost as much as anything could. Uh, uh, an ancient vexed quarrel uh, undertaken by a uh, Plato, surely greatest of philosophers against Homer, greatest of uh, ancient poets, and a rival indeed uh, to the Torah. Um, uh, as you know, Plato uh, in the Republic exiles. Homer exiles the poets. Uh, had Shakespeare shown up in uh, Plato's Republic, no doubt Plato would have respectfully shown him to the border and pushed him back uh, over it. Um, it is the most ancient of quarrels, and I don't suppose it will ever end. Uh, Shakespeare, uh, who to me, I suppose, does seem like the beginning of the middle and the end of everything. Ah, it fascinates me that two of the greatest of philosophers, uh, David Hume and Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, had very mixed feelings about uh, Shakespeare. Uh, uh, in reading Hume on uh, Shakespeare, uh, one does hear renewed uh, the ancient quarrel between poetry and philosophy. Uh, Wittgenstein gives it a very surprising turn of his own when he tries to say, uh, perhaps we should think of Shakespeare as a creator of language, and I think that is an evasion on Wittgenstein's part, because surely, though of course, a creator of language Shakespeare is also a creator of thought. 
He is a creator of meaning. In fact, I, I would think more than any other writer of whom we have record, uh, Shakespeare is the great teacher of how meaning gets started. A very, a very good poet, uh, indeed, uh, I reread him almost continually. Uh, I think he has a, a fair number of admirers, perhaps more among poets than a general public, uh, though he's a very different poet from my own, uh, one of my great favorites, who now also is only read by a few poets and critics, uh, John Brooks Wheelwright, uh, a uh, Boston poet killed alas by a drunken driver uh, in Boston, I think when he was 39 or 40, and who left a great elegy on Hart Crane called Fish Food in, in no disparagement of uh, Crane and a wonderful poem, uh, in effect saying, come over to America and help us in the 14ers of William Blake's uh, prophetic books. Uh, but Keyes, Keyes, I think, is a permanent poet. I, I cannot altogether understand why Keyes and Wheelwright uh, do not have more admirers than they have. Yes, I, uh, I strongly do feel that, though. I would be in despair if I uh, tried to argue the point, since uh, most public school systems uh, are now all but altogether given over to uh, setting works for study that uh, directly come from the, I, I don't want to go through it again, the, the, the question of uh, ethnic origin uh, and so forth, but I, I don't want to get into that again. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, to start with the second uh, of your points, uh, I, I don't think there is such a thing as postmodernist literature. I, I think that what is called modernist literature and so on. These are all, I think, different phases of what we can call post-enlightenment uh, literature, that is to say, post-Miltonic uh, literature uh, in English. Uh, and I, I, I don't find profound differences between 19th century uh, so-called modernist and so-called post-modernist uh, literature. As to the first, uh, I, I, I'm not at all sure that I agree with you. Uh, it, it hardly seems to me that uh, most university and college faculties are, you know, staffed by my, my fellow members of the Democratic Party with a capital D or, or liberals uh, among us. Uh, my, my, my complaints, of course, are not really against uh, people who take one stand or another in national politics, but who would substitute their version of cultural politics for a broader view uh, of culture. But thank you. Well, I, I, partly out of my quite negative reaction to the uh, prevalence of the Harry Potter books, which, which seemed to me rubbish, uh, only good for the dustbin, where, where they will certainly wind up in a generation or so. Uh, I, I did compile an anthology a, a couple of years back with the rather <laughs> outrageous title, uh, Stories and Poems for, I think it's over there somewhere, for extremely intelligent, uh, there it is, for extremely intelligent uh, um, children of all ages, uh, including oneself. And uh, uh, it was meant as a kind of uh, introduction, which would bring together uh, a great many stories and poems that I thought was very appropriate. It, 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 it is an interesting puzzle. Uh, a lot of people have said to me that uh, it's all very well for me to deplore the Harry Potter books, but nevertheless, this is the one thing that their children will read. Uh, I think the whole question is, well, what will they read uh, after, uh, after they have read uh, Harry Potter? Will, will they go on to... Uh, well, they go on to uh, 
Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, uh, will they go on to uh, Kenneth Graham's uh, The Wind in the Willows? Will, will they uh, go on, really, to uh, high literature? Will they go on to Mark Twain and to Hemingway and eventually Jane Austen? Uh, I thought, in a way, uh, that the novelist Stephen King, uh, whose work uh, does not move me, uh, got this quite right. I don't think he was being ironical. Uh, somebody showed this to me that in a review of the Sunday Times book review of, perhaps it was the fourth volume in the Potter series, he uh, welcomed it and said, this is wonderful. He said, he said uh, if they are reading this when they are 10 or 11 or 12, then they will, they will graduate to reading Stephen King a year or two later. I would not argue with him at all about that. Thank you immensely, Susan, and thank Brian for me when you see him.